From 1977 to 1979, Spider-Man swung onto the small screen in the Amazing Spider-Man TV series, where Nicholas Hammond played freelance photographer Peter Parker and his heroic web-crawling alter ego Spider-Man, where after getting bitten by a radioactive spider, Parker now possesses many strange spider-like powers, where he uses his newfound abilities to suit up as Spider-Man, where he goes after many deadly enemies. Well, as deadly as a TV budget from the 70s would allow. Okay, there was no Thanos or Green Goblin, but let's be honest, some of those petty crooks sure were up to no good. Where in each episode, Spider-Man would solve some kind of sinister crime caper and save the day, complete with funky 1970s music. In this memorable TV show, which is fondly remembered by many Spider-Man fans who grew up watching it. And so today we are going to web sling ourselves into the past, the funky disco days of the 70s to be precise, as we explore 10 things that you didn't know about the amazing Spider-Man TV show. So let's get our spider senses tingling as we check it out. Number 10, The Superhero Network. As we all know, Spider-Man was created in 1962 by Marvel's creative leader Stan Lee and Steve Ditko, where the teenage superhero called Peter Parker, who was left with amazing spider abilities and powers, made his debut in Amazing Fantasy issue 15. And from there, Spider-Man, or as he's affectionately known as, Spidey, has become one of the most popular and successful superheroes to grace comic book pages. As soon as people see the iconic red and blue costume, they know straight away that they are looking at Spider-Man. During the 1970s, TV station CBS was making leaps and bounds into the superhero genre, as it was producing several TV shows based on comic book characters, including Shazam and Wonder Woman. And in 1977, the same year the channel would also broadcast the pilot episodes for the Incredible Hulk TV show, Stanley also sold the rights of Spider-Man to CBS, so the channel could make a Spider-Man TV series. Yes indeed, CBS was becoming the Superhero Network, a station dedicated to primetime superhero adventures. And now it had the amazing Spider-Man to add to its lineup. So it'll seem that CBS found a winning formula with broadcasting superheroes with their own TV shows. But the big question is, who could play the famous web slinger? Number 9. Nicholas Hammond got the part because of a play. Nicholas Hammond was born in 1950 and had been starring in front of the camera ever since he was a child, starring in the original 1963 Lord of the Flies movie, where he played Robert, and in 1967's The Sound of Music, where he played Friedrich. And during the 70s, he even appeared in episodes of several well-known TV shows, including The Brady Bunch and Hawaii Five-0. CBS wanted to cast Hammond in the role of Spider-Man after he was seen performing in the play The Importance of Being Earnest in Los Angeles. I guess an executive really saw a spark in Hammond in this play and just felt that he was right for Peter Parker and his alter ego Spider-Man. However, in order to take on the role, Hammond insisted that he played the part seriously, like a real person. He didn't want the part to be campy like the Adam West Batman, and CBS agreed. And I think this approach helped, as in the Spider-Man TV show, Hammond's Peter Parker comes off as an everyman, just a regular Joe and an underdog, who also happens to have these amazing abilities and powers. And I think that this approach suits Spider-Man's overall demeanor, and he certainly had a real life-like ability. You were rooting for this guy and wanted him to save the day. 
However, in reality, there was kind of two people who played the part, as Hammond played Peter Parker, but most of the Spider-Man scenes, particularly the stunt work, were performed by stunt coordinator Fred Waugh. And to be fair, a lot of the stunts done for the TV show, especially the scenes of Spider-Man on rooftops and seemingly crawling down buildings and swinging around skyscrapers, were actually very impressive for its time, and often very dangerous. Keep in mind, this was before the day and age of CGI. So thanks to the likeable acting chops of Nicholas Hammond and the brave stunt work of Fred Waugh, Spider-Man was brought to life on the small screen. Number 8. The pilot became a theatrical movie. So in order to get the TV series off the ground, a 90 minute pilot was put together, which tells the backstory of Peter Parker, who was a freelance photographer for the Daily Bugle, who gets bitten by a radioactive spider, which leaves him with superpowers like climbing up walls and a spider sense. The pilot also sees Spider-Man going up against a villain called the Guru, who uses mind control powers in order to make innocent people commit crimes like robbing banks. Yeah, look, it probably wasn't the most exciting storyline, and it is dated, what with all its 1970s-isms, but it did its job in setting up the show. And I guess we have to keep in mind that it was made on a TV budget. It was broadcast on CBS on September the 14th, 1977, and it actually got impressive ratings, making it the highest rated CBS production of that year. So, the show was off to a good start. However, it was decided to release the pilot theatrically in other parts of the world, where the Spider-Man pilot was released as a theatrical movie in Australia and Europe. In the UK, it was actually shown as a double bill with Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. You know, just throwing it out there. And it was actually quite successful, making $9 million in the overseas box office. Now, it wasn't uncommon for TV movies to get theatrical releases in Europe back in the 70s, as in that decade, the same thing happened with Steven Spielberg's Duel and Salem's Lot. However, what's interesting about the theatrical release of the Spider-Man pilot is that it was distributed by Columbia Pictures, whom have been releasing Spider-Man movies ever since, although now the company has evolved into Sony Pictures. The following year, in 1978, Superman the movie came out and was a massive success. So to keep up with the trend, two further Spider-Man theatrical movies were released, which were made up of editing together episodes from the TV show. These releases include Spider-Man Strikes Back in 1978 and Spider-Man The Dragon's Challenge in 1981. Although the sequels didn't get the best reviews, with monthly film bulletin labeling Spider-Man Strikes Back as a cut price Superman, which lacks the stylistic wallop of the comic strip that it's based on but it has to be taken into account that these movies were made on a 1970s TV budget and didn't have the luxurious higher budget of the Superman movies. But yeah, growing up as a kid outside America, long before the Sam Raimi movies, we already had three Spider-Man movies, and I was none the wiser that they were actually TV shows edited into movies. Whenever they were on TV or I saw them in a video store, I always made sure that I watched them. My only complaint is, as a kid, I didn't know why we didn't see so much of Spider-Man and why the baddies were generic crooks without the well-known Spider-Man villains being seen in the show. But more on that later. Number seven, Stan Lee was not a fan of the show. Despite the fact that Stan Lee sold the rights of Spider-Man to make the TV show, and that there's pictures of him on the set where he looks quite happy, he really was not a fan of the show. He felt like CBS just went in completely the wrong direction. He would go on to tell Pizzazz magazine that he felt that the show was too juvenile. And according to IMDB, he felt the show was making Spider-Man more of a cardboard character. Despite the fact that also at that time, the Incredible Hulk TV series was also in production, which Lee actually really liked, appreciating its maturity and overall emotional tone. It is said that Lee would often clash with the Spider-Man show's producer, Daniel Goodman, over the direction of the show, and found the overall experience of being a creative consultant on the show to be a total nightmare. 
However, it seemed that even CBS itself had issues with the show as well. As although the Spider-Man series was popular with the child demographic, CBS was concerned over low ratings with older audiences in the 18 to 49 age range, and was constantly trying to find ways to appeal to older audiences, where they would constantly be making changes throughout the series, where they would try to involve more realistic storylines, as well as giving Spider-Man a reoccurring love interest and restricting Spider-Man's superpowers in order to make him more relatable to adult viewers. It actually kind of feels like this was a production making a Spider-Man show who were kind of embarrassed about Spider-Man and felt like it had to tone down Spider-Man. But I guess the question is, is it a good idea to tone down Spider-Man in a show based on Spider-Man? The thing is, the Amazing Spider-Man TV show was successful. The child audiences loved it. But I guess for some reason there was this feeling of that's not good enough. We need adults to watch this too. Look, I don't know. I just think if you've got a successful market, stick with that if it works. But then again, I'm not a TV producer. Number six, differences from the comics. Something else which I think may have hurt the show, particularly among fans of the comics, were the many changes made from the source material. And there were many changes made. For example, in the original comics, Peter Parker was a teenager in high school, but in the show he was a grad student. And I always got the feeling in the show that Peter wasn't a kid, but a young man in his early to mid-twenties. There was no Uncle Ben, whom in the comics was the catalyst for Peter to use his powers to do good, as well as none of Spider-Man's well-known love interests like Mary Jane or Gwen Stacy. Instead, a new love interest called Julie Masters was introduced in Season 2. The part was played by Ellen Bry, who incidentally previously did stunt work for Superman the movie. Peter's best friend, Harry Osborn, was also absent. Instead, Peter's best friend was a fellow Daily Bugle employee called Rita Conway, played by actress and singer Chip Fields. I think the change that hurt the show the most was the lack of memorable villains, as Spider-Man has a well-known lineup of classic villains like the Green Goblin, Doctor Octopus, Electro and Kingpin. But none of these rich characters were used. Instead, we'll often see Spider-Man go up against petty crooks, gangsters and other low-grade criminals. I guess the issue with this direction is the Spider-Man comics were spectacular, with spectacular stories. But I guess that some felt the Spider-Man TV show wasn't so spectacular if he was going up against some Joe somebody petty criminal. Maybe that approach just took the amazing out of the amazing Spider-Man. But I guess we have to take into account, as I've mentioned several times now, that this is a TV show with a TV show budget. How can you make a flying green goblin, or a man with metallic tentacles on a 1970s TV budget? Now there were some characters from the original source material who did turn up, including Art May who shows up every now and then, played by two different actresses, those being Jeff Donnell and Irene Tedrow as well as J. Jonah Jameson, who, incidentally in this Spider-Universe, actually likes Spider-Man, who over the course of the series was also played by two actors, those being David White in the pilot, and Robert Simon in the rest of the series. One thing I do know is that in the 1970s, we got a Spider-Man comic where Spidey comes face to face with Jaws. Now I would have paid to see that crossover. Number 5. Sporadic Airing Unlike fellow CBS superhero TV shows like Wonder Woman and The Incredible Hulk, which would have fluent and uninterrupted seasons, some of which would surpass 20 episodes per series, The Amazing Spider-Man TV series wasn't so lucky, as it had a much lower count of episodes, which were often randomly broadcast all over the place without any constant schedule, which is something else that may have contributed to hurting the show. Despite the pilot's impressive ratings, CBS weren't too sure about the show's potential, once again on the account that it didn't draw in many adult viewers. So for its first season, only five episodes were produced, which were broadcast from April to May 1978. And despite the ratings actually doing very good, with the first episode being the highest rating program of CBS that week, and the series overall being the 19th highest rating show on CBS, there was still hesitation. 
So with the show's second season, which now consisted of eight episodes, this time the episodes had no schedule and were deliberately placed at times to try and knock out competing TV stations. So the show had no routine. Fans just had to catch up with episodes when they may or may not be broadcast, meaning some episodes had a month or even two months gap in between broadcasts, with the biggest gap taking place in between episode 6, Wolfpack, and episode 7, The Chinese Web Part 1, having a gap lasting over four months. Which, I could imagine, may have made the show tricky for fans to keep up with, as well as keeping their interest in the show. But despite this, the ratings were still very good, with the second season airing from September 1978 to July 1979. The weird thing about this show is the production was treating it like it was a failure, but it actually was a success. Despite its ratings, it seems that there was just no faith or confidence in the show. From the outside looking in, it looks like CBS had no faith in it, and Stan Lee definitely didn't seem to have faith in it. And overall, it feels like CBS had the rights to Spider-Man, but just didn't know what to do with him. Maybe it just came out at a time when it was looked down upon to make superhero shows, as the superhero genre wasn't as respected as it is now, and was probably seen as silly. But I can't help but feel like if those behind the show did have more love and faith in it, then the Spider-Man TV series could have been classic. Now don't get me wrong, I do think the show already is a classic, but I think it could have been so much more. Maybe we could have gotten many more amazing on-screen adventures, and the show could have lasted longer. Number 4. Filming Despite being set in New York City, which in the comic book is universally known as the home of Spider-Man, particularly Queens, the TV series was actually shot in and around Los Angeles. Due to time and budget reasons, the show had a really tight schedule, with each episode being given a total of just seven days to shoot. So to combat this, while filming, the first unit team were filming scenes with Nicholas Hammond as Peter Parker, with the second unit simultaneously filming scenes with Freddie Waugh in the Spider-Man suit, particularly the stunts. This is why there are often lengthy scenes where we don't really hear Spider-Man doing much talking. And as a result of this, most episodes consisted of 85% of the show revolving around Peter Parker, with only 15% featuring Spider-Man. I think this is why, as a kid, when I used to watch the show, I was constantly waiting for Spider-Man in all his blue and red glory to show up. And I did! I'd watch the show, and wait, and wait, and wait, and finally Spider-Man would spring into action. But whenever Spider-Man did turn up, it was always magical and worth the wait. Number three, the Japanese Spider-Man show. Now the Amazing Spider-Man TV series wasn't the first live action adaptation of Spider-Man. That honor belongs to the children's television workshop series, The Electric Company, in a skit called The Super Spider-Man Stories, which featured a puppeteer and dancer called Danny Seagren as Spider-Man. The performance predated The Amazing Spider-Man TV show by three years, with it being broadcast on PBS in 1974. However, during the Amazing Spider-Man TV show's run, Marvel and Toei simultaneously released an alternative Japanese live-action TV show version of Spider-Man. Now, despite wearing the traditional costume, this version of Spider-Man deeply deviates from the original source material, where Spider-Man is now a motocross racer called Takuya Yamashiro, who gets amazing Spider-Man abilities when injected with a spider serum by an alien called Gurria. Spider-Man in this rendition often fights an army of foot soldiers known as Nindas. And in Power Rangers fashion, Spider-Man can also summon up a giant Megazord-style robot called Lepidon, which Spider-Man can use to fight enemies who also grow in size. The show consisted of 48 episodes plus one film, and ran from 1978 to 1979. So there was literally two Spider-Man TV shows running simultaneously at the same time one in the States, and the other in Japan. And this alternative version of Spider-Man is often looked back upon fondly, and is considered a fun, action-packed show. And thanks to the show gaining more awareness in modern years, thanks to the internet, many actually consider this version of Spider-Man to be the better of the two shows, with its fan base constantly increasing to the point where it now has a cult following. 
And after having a good look at the Japanese Spider-Man, I think he's even wearing the same costume as the American Spider-Man, only the Japanese one has a different mask. The Japanese Spider-Man show has definitely become an interesting anomaly in Spider-Man's long history, as well as a sought-after curiosity by fans. Number 2. Cancellation So on July the 6th, 1979, after airing the 7th and 8th episodes of Season 2 back-to-back, -back, CBS decided it was time to finally pull the plug on the amazing Spider-Man TV series. It's popular belief that the show was cancelled due to poor ratings, but that's not true. Now don't get me wrong, the show did have its criticisms, particularly from comic book fans who wanted to see Spider-Man fight traditional villains from the comics. But that aside, the ratings of the show were actually quite good. The reason given for axing the show was CBS didn't want to become known as the superhero network. They feared that they were starting to be perceived as one-dimensional, and I guess they wanted to appear more sophisticated. Once again, this was at a time when superheroes weren't really as respected. The network had previously scrapped the Shazam and Isis TV shows, as well as Wonder Woman, a Captain America TV show which only had two made-for-TV movies produced, and a proposed Doctor Strange series which only had a pilot filmed. The only hero to survive the CBS chopping block was the Incredible Hulk, which aired up until 1982. And just like that, after two years and a total of 13 episodes, this version of Spider-Man had swung on his last web and was now no more. But I guess it goes without saying that this show wasn't just a show that came and went with a minimal fan base, as was originally perceived, as over the years its fan base has increased, with many people who generally have a love of the show and adore it, with it now being considered as a respectful and important chapter in the history of Spider-Man and superhero TV shows in general. Number 1. The Spider-Man and Hulk reunion movie that nearly was. So had things worked out differently, Season 2 of The Amazing Spider-Man may not have been the end of this version of Spider-Man, as in 1984 there was a rather ambitious idea of having a Spider-Man and Incredible Hulk crossover movie, which would have seen the TV show version of Spider-Man coming face to face with the TV version of The Incredible Hulk. The production saw Columbia Pictures joining forces with Universal Pictures, with both Nicholas Hammond and Bill Bixby set to return to their iconic roles for this epic movie. And not only that, but Bixby was also set to direct the picture. And the story would involve Nicholas Hammond's Spider-Man wearing the black Spider-Man suit, which was a popular story in the comic books at that time. However, the production collapsed and nothing came of it. Hammond claims that he was informed that the movie was dropped because Lou Ferrigno was unable to play Banner in his Hulk formation as he was too busy filming Hercules at the time. But Ferrigno has spoken back about this, saying that he wasn't even asked to return, and that he would have been free at the time of filming as he had already filmed Hercules and thus he would have returned. There are other speculations that the project was scrapped due to budgetary reasons. However, Bill Bixby's and Lou Ferrigno's versions of the Hulk would return in a variety of TV movies from 1988 to 1990, and as planned with the crossover movie, he teams up with fellow Marvel heroes, including Daredevil and Thor. Two years after the Spider-Man and Hulk movie was scrapped, Canon then planned to make their own Spider-Man movie, which would then evolve into a James Cameron Spider-Man movie, which then itself evolved into the Sam Raimi movie, and, well, the rest was history. Interestingly, there are rumours that Nicholas Hammond was set to star in Spider-Man No Way Home, but as a cab driver. However, those scenes didn't end up getting filmed, but I don't know if this is fact or rumour. So as it happens, the Amazing Spider-Man TV show universe only consists of 13 episodes, which were gloriously broadcast with great panache from 1977 to 1979, and that's the lot. Despite the lack of faith by those behind it, it was a successful show and had an adoring fan base. It had enjoyable adventures with a very likeable Peter Parker and Spider-Man. And like so many others, this show is a cherished piece of my childhood. Now these days, superhero TV shows are not only very common, but kind of top of the range, particularly with streaming services. But the original Amazing Spider-Man TV show came out at a time when this wasn't the case, when it had to go against all odds. 
It had to go against a lack of confidence in the show and an attitude that it was too childish. But for that short period of time in the late 70s, the Spider-Man series stood tall and proved that it was an enjoyable and worthy Spider-Man experience. And yes, I think the show was a noble attempt at making fun superhero stories with an essence of grounded believability. Stepping away from the cheesy and campy era of 1960s Batman, which is what everyone thought of when they thought of superhero TV shows at that time. I think the show had so much more potential, but, you know, it is what it is. I actually loved the show growing up and would stop whatever I was doing to watch it. And I know it's not full of bangs and crashes like modern live action superhero media, but it was made in a simpler time when all you needed to be happy was to see Spider-Man fight some petty crooks. Anyway, I'm your friendly neighborhood Minty. See ya.